What's up everybody? It's Megan here with Student Loan Planner and today we're going to be chatting about how to reduce debt as a physician with student loans. Now, student loans are not a fun topic, but many physicians have them. Uh, physicians are actually one of the, mo the, um, the top professions that we typically advise on student loan repayment for and student loan debt is pretty common among, among this profession. The average that we see is between about 300 to 330,000 uh, of student loan debt outstanding, which averages are dangerous because that does mean that there are folks with a lot more than that and there's folks with less than that. So just keep that in mind, This take this with a grain of salt. But average income, physicians, and your income is, is kind of interesting, right? Uh, especially early on because you're in school for a long time and then you go into training or residency for a long time maybe even fellowship. And that just means that your income post-graduation doesn't, it, we don't get that doctor income immediately, right? So reducing debt, reducing our student loans post-graduation during residency can be proven to be pretty challenging, especially if we have a pretty large balance, like a mortgage size balance. With that said, the average income ranges, of course, between specialty area, uh, also area of the country that you live in, how populated that area is. And primary care averages, I think we see about 242,000 for the average income, maybe round that to about 250. That's about what I would expect or about what I would gather from the folks that we've worked with who have done a student loan plan with us. Uh, specialists are a little higher. They're, well, they can be a lot higher depending on what you're doing. But specialists, uh, the average is about 344,000 compared to about 250. So let's say 250 for primary care, family medicine type uh, specialty type role and specialists will be about 100 grand more on average, but could be quite a bit more depending on what you're doing, like plastics or surgery. And your student loan plan, depending on where your income level is going to be in the future, can look very different. So you might be like, you know, labeled a physician, but your plan compared to your plastic surgery friend could be very different if you're if you're in family practice or if you're an OBGYN, your plan could be very different. And so I think that's the moral of, of what I wanted to start with. The moral of the story for what I wanted to start with is your plan is going to be specific to your financial situation, your family situation and your preferences. That's a, a big part, too. So don't feel like your plan has to be the same as your colleague or as a schoolmate because it's probably not going to be in the sense of we're not going to have the same set of facts, same set of income details, family details, what your spouse makes, if your spouse has student loans or not. So there's a lot of things that go into customizing your plan, which can feel a little overwhelming. But I challenge you to think about that as a good thing, because that means we do have a lot of options when that's way better than being backed into a corner, right? <laughs> so now income wise, going back to just how your income is pretty interesting, you graduate, you start out in residency and you're making probably the lowest income you're ever gonna make. Residency salaries can range between 60 to maybe 75 or 80,000 a year, maybe, depending on what year of residency you are or where you're at. So not super high income compared to what you will be making later. And that needs to be considered, too, when we're talking about reducing debt, because you might not have that big of a shovel early on, like starting out to, to work down your debt, which needs to be taken into account. Your attending salary will kick in later on, maybe three, four years down the road. Or if you're a specialist and you're continuing on doing more uh, training in fellowship or just a, a different residency, a longer residency, that that certainly needs to come into play. So your plan needs to be able to pivot a little bit and cater to the the, the season that you're in, which do, goes against kind of debt advice, right? Debt advice would say like, throw all of your extra cash towards your debt, pay it off as soon as possible, like your hair is on fire. That may not need to be the approach that you take, okay? So the first thing what we're, that we're gonna do is really filter you into one of two buckets to help you identify how you should be thinking about your student loans and how you should be treating them when it comes to paying them down or just thinking about them in general. 
the question we need to be asking ourselves is where is our income in comparison to our debt balance? Okay, so think about, and this is again, tricky for physicians because your residency income is not necessarily what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your future attending income. Think about where that income is going to be in comparison to your debt first. So if our income in the future is going to be a lot greater than what our student loan balance is, then we should be treating our loans a little more aggressively and paying them off more like a debt. Uh, duh, right? That kind of sounds like what debt is and what we do with debt. But federal student loans are a little interesting, right? So on the flip side, if you're someone whose balance is a lot greater than your income, or, or it will be for your attending income, then you might want to consider a passive approach to your student loan plan. And that sounds uh, kind of funny. It's a very weird concept because, again, we've always been taught to pay down debt really aggressively. But if our income is a lot less than what our balance is going to be in the future, it's going to take a big shovel or a big amount of effort to pay that debt off. And we do have options within the federal system to be more passive with our student loans by through, you know, through income driven repayment and through public service loan forgiveness. Forgiveness is a real thing with federal student loans, which uh, again is kind of a weird concept because it doesn't, forgiveness doesn't exist with any other kind of debt. So this is a, a different ball game. And the, the other thing I want you to keep in mind, too, so once you kind of decide where is my income in comparison to my debt and what bucket should I put myself in here? Next kind of side question is, are you going to be staying in a public service capacity, which this is pretty common in the physician space because a lot of doctors tend to work for or in a hospital. A lot of hospitals are 501c3 entities, which is eligible for that program, public service loan forgiveness. We're going to talk a bit about that here in a little in a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit more about public service loan forgiveness coming up. But what's important to do first is to figure out, are we paying the loans off or are we going towards a loan forgiveness trajectory? And now we can start to decide how do we pay down the debt faster or how do we uh, go towards loan forgiveness more efficiently and pay less on our payments. If we're paying the loans off, we need to be treating the loans as a debt. And the goal would be to reduce that debt as much as we can, reduce the cost as much as we can. So the first thing we can start to consider doing is minimizing our interest. And that could be through interest subsidies, interest discounts that we have through income driven repayment plans, which that might be a little confusing thinking, well, well, I don't think I want to go on an income driven plan if I'm trying to pay the loans off, but it could be a strategic move for you actually as a physician, especially in the, the earlier years of your career when you're in residency and your income is at its lower point. If you have a monthly payment on an income driven plan that doesn't cover the cost of interest, then that accruing interest, depending on the plan that you're on, could be waived which is pretty significant because that makes your effective interest rate a lot lower, minimizing your interest cost ultimately. And the less we pay in interest, the less we pay overall. So that is, that's one way we can minimize our interest overall is, is signing up for an income driven plan, taking advantage of the interest subsidies that are associated with them. Uh, another way we can reduce interest is by paying while we're in school, if that's possible, or if our payment again is lower, we're able to afford to pay extra that kind of goes into this next line but paying extra towards the loans is going to help you reduce the debt faster so paying extra if and when you can to throw towards the principal that'll help you reduce the interest that'll help you pay down the debt faster and get out of debt faster and third up it helps uh, i think the the first two kind of can tie in to refinancing where refinancing is a process where you take your existing loan to a private company and the goal is to uh, restructure that loan get a term that you can commit to a uh, payment that you can commit to but most importantly you want a lower interest rate than what you already have that would be the goal of refinancing is restructuring it to be able to pay it off more efficiently and that efficiency comes with a decent term and a lower interest rate. 
Now, I do want to caution you, though, refinancing is a permanent decision. So you want to make sure that that's what you should be doing with your student loan plan before you do it, because we can't back out of it once we've already signed the documents and refinanced. We can't go back into the federal system. So I really hesitate to tell folks in residency to look at refinancing because that can just be too early. We don't know what your income is going to look like post-residency. We have maybe some good assumptions, but I think it's just too early to know for sure before committing to something really permanent. Um, there could be reasons, of course, there could be reasons why refinancing and residency could make sense. Um, certainly could be reasons for refinancing to make sense if you're an attending physician with your higher income. But that's just one thing to keep in mind is that it's a permanent decision. And oftentimes that's the most like catastrophic mistake that I see is just making those permanent decisions. The last thing on here, how to reduce debt is taking advantage of loan repayment programs. There are a number of different programs available out there for physicians. A lot of them have to do with working in high need areas or very rural areas. And they, the program, whichever one it is, will forgive up to a certain uh, amount of debt, either per year of commitment or per like whatever the term is. You have to go by the terms. So, for example, if you're someone who's working at the VA, you could sign up for the VA's EDRP plan, which uh, this plan will give you up to forty thousand a year reimbursed for uh, you making payments. So let's say you're paying each month, your payments are $1,000 a month, you, you know, 12,000 over the course of the year, that program, the VA EDRP plan will reimburse that full 12,000 that you paid that year. So you basically come out of pocket initially, but then you get that money refunded to you. So at the end of that five year term, it's a five year term at the VA, whatever you've paid, has been reimbursed, so you haven't come out of pocket, and you can do that up to 40,000 a year. So even though your payment isn't maybe 40,000 a year when you add those up, if you're trying to reduce the debt and pay it off as soon as possible, and your balance is relatively smaller, I should say, lower than the average, so maybe your balance is like 200,000 or 250,000, then this VA EDRP program could be something to consider because if you're able to stomach paying 40,000 a year, you can have all of this debt done or a, a large portion of this debt done in that five year time period and basically not come out of pocket for it because you get reimbursed every, you know, year after year. So that's a pretty cool program. Um, you can technically use the VA EDRP with public service loan forgiveness because working for the VA, you're obviously working for the government, which is an eligible employer for that PSLF program. Should you double dip and do both? Uh, again, you can, but you want to think about, you know, if your balance is a lot greater than that maximum, the 200000 that you can get from that program over that five years, let's say you are closer to that average of like 330000 of debt or more, then PSLF might be bigger bang for your buck if you like the lifestyle and the work-life balance of working for the VA for 10 years. That's the thing is PSLF is 100% of loan forgiveness after 120 payments, which is 10 years. The VA EDRP is a five-year program where you can get up to $40,000 reimbursed. It's a reimbursement program. So you have to kind of decide, you know, what do I want to do with my career for the kind of short-term, intermediate-term future? If you want to stay at the VA, you have full intentions of staying at the VA and your balance is a lot greater than 200000 then maybe consider PSLF and you can use the VA EDRP to subsidize your payments for the first five years. Basically reimburse yourself and that way you don't have to pay out of pocket uh, for the first five years of that program. But if your balance is lower, uh, closer to 200000 or less, that EDRP program can really pay off the whole balance, which is pretty cool. And if you didn't plan on staying at the VA long term, then you could just commit to it as long as you get that EDRP money and roll to the next opportunity uh, when the loans are all paid off. So that's one way to pay down debt. There's also some other like NHSC. That's another program you can look into if you're OK with committing to like a one or two year contract working in a rural area or a very high need area. 
The amounts that they award are lower, uh, but could still be a really great option if your main goal is to reduce the debt and pay it off as soon as possible, and you don't mind sacrificing a couple years of working in a high need area. What if you're not trying to pay the loans off though, <laughs> right? So we know forgiveness is an option. Uh, what if we're not trying to pay the loans off because our balance is a lot greater than our income or we're working in that public service capacity to where we can entertain public service loan forgiveness? Well, then we've got some options. <laughs> then things change a little bit. Reducing payments becomes our priority because we want to pay as little as possible to maximize how much we can get forgiven later. So a couple of ways we can reduce payments. If you're married, Tax filing statuses really do matter, uh, weirdly. So the payments are based off of income, as we know, if we're going towards an income-driven plan and it's forgiveness timeline. Um, if we're filing taxes with a spouse and we file taxes married filing jointly, the payment is going to be based off of you and your spouse's income. And I know it is not fair. That doesn't make sense. Why would they do that? I don't know. That is how the legislation was written. And so the way we can get around it is by looking into filing taxes married, but separately. That is a tax filing option that you have every year. You can also flip back and forth. If you filed married jointly your whole life and you're concerned about filing separately now, don't be concerned. It's, it's really something that you can choose to do every year. But it is a way to keep the payment off of just your income. If your spouse does not have student loans, but they do have significant income and you're trying to go towards loan forgiveness, married filing separate could be a really great option to consider. But chat with the CPA about it, tax with your or chat with your planner about it. And to kind of put this on steroids, if you live in a community property state, the opportunities uh, for filing separately in a community property state are uh, greater <laughs> in the sense of if you live in one of these nine states, I listed them in the order of like how I looked at them on the map. So they're not in alphabetical order. Sorry, I'm a visual person. Um, but Washington State, Idaho, California, Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico, Texas, Louisiana, and Wisconsin. These states, what they do when you file separately is they add your income plus your spouse's income together. They add that together. And then when they put it on the federal tax return, it's split it in half, that they split it in half. So it's uh, done through this form, the 8958 form, I think it is, uh, that, that splits the income. And so to put this in a, into an example, let's say you earn uh, $300,000 as a physician. Your spouse is a stay-at-home spouse. They don't earn income. You could still file taxes married separately and in a community property state, what would happen is they take your income plus your spouse's income. So 300,000 plus zero gets us 300,000 and they divide that income in half because we're in a community property state where all income is joint you know, property. And so on your tax return, it's going to show 150,000 of income and on your spouse's tax return, it's going to show 150,000 of income. And your student loan payment, if we're filing separately, is going to be based off of just your tax return, that $150,000. That's a significant way to, to reduce your student loan payment. We call this the breadwinner loophole in our planning. And it can't hurt you. So this strategy can't hurt you in the sense of if your income is actually lower than your spouse's, you could still file separately. And instead of using the tax return to verify income, you can submit alternative documentation of income. There are ways to, to still use uh, filing separately in community property states if you are not the breadwinner and it's still very advantageous. So very interesting ways that we can lower the payment right then and there if we're married. Next up are contributing to pre-tax accounts. So HSAs, FSAs, 401ks, solo 401ks, um, depending on if you're at a really small practice like SEP IRA, simple IRA, probably less common. But HSAs, FSAs, these are health savings vehicles. They're pre-tax. What that means is you, let's say you make $100,000 you contribute to an HSA or an FSA, you get to deduct your contributions from your $300,000 on your tax return. So your income looks less when you go and file taxes because it is a pre-tax uh, contribution. 
Same thing with 401k and solo 401k. You as the employee can contribute 23,000 as of 2024 this year. Um, pretty big bucket, right? That's a lot of money we can save towards retirement. And it's a lot of money we can hide from your tax return <laughs> in the sense of we save money on taxes today for contributing to it. And our income looks lower on our tax return. So it saves us on our student loan payment when they calculate the payment for you. Next up, we can talk about extending tax filings. Now, since we're on an income driven plan and we have to update our income every 12 months, we can strategically think about when are we going to have to update our income and coordinate that with when we're filing our most recently filed tax return. So, for example, if you're on an income driven plan, let's say your anniversary date is September of every year. And let's just use current years right now. So this is 2024. Your most recent tax return that could be on file right now is 2023. Uh, the year before that would have been 2022. But let's say you knew that your anniversary date was in September of this year and 2022's tax return is lower income than what 2023 is going to show. Because naturally, like your income will have some kind of like, you know, increase year over year. Hopefully that's the goal, right? So 2022's tax return is actually better for you to use and you can strategically extend filing 2023. And that just means you file a form, you file an extension with the IRS that says, hey, here's my draft. I'm not done, but I will file by October 15th, which is the deadline later on. So if your anniversary is in September, that's great because then when, you know, if we go ahead and file to extend the tax return, we can uh, recertify income come September and it's going to link back to the most recent tax return on file, which at that point is going to be 2022 because we extended 2023. And then we can go and file by the deadline, the extension deadline of October 15th for taxes. So that's one hack to try to keep the payment as low as possible for as long as possible, being about two years behind on when it's actually reflecting your income, which is pretty cool. So that's one strategy. Another strategy is tax loss harvesting. This is one of my favorite financial planning tools or strategies, I think, regardless. Uh, this is, it can impact your student loan payments, but it also helps just make you more tax efficient over time. And it kind of hoards some tax write-offs for your future self. So this is a long ball game. It is, you know, it, it can impact you year over year, but the big benefits are also long term. So it's something that you would do consistently on an ongoing basis. Uh, but tax loss harvesting in a nutshell, what it is, is we're investing in a taxable account. So let's say a non-retirement uh, brokerage account that you have. Maybe you're saving for the tax bomb, for the income-driven repayment tax implication later on. This account is not tax preferred, right? So we don't get to deduct how much we put into this account. And it's taxable. It's not tax-free like Roth money. So that just means that if we have a gain in this account, we're going to be taxed on that gain year over year, which kind of stinks. But if we have losses in this account, we can write off those losses either against gains or we can write them off as a capital loss on our tax return, which reduces our adjusted gross income. So pretty nifty like investing strategy, uh, tax loss harvesting. So what we would do in it uh, basically is we we know that the market ebbs and flows and you're probably invested in multiple funds. Let's say one fund is not doing so hot this month for whatever reason, it's dipped. We have somewhat of a loss on it. What we do is we strategically sell that position and purchase something similar. So we're still in the market, but we, we sold the losing position, purchased something similar. And then what we can do is, is we've realized that loss and that loss is what we can write off against a future gain. You know, if we have other funds that are doing better and we have some gains in those accounts um, or we can hoard it and use it to write off against bigger gains in the future. So like if you sell a house in the future, a really appreciated house, and you've got a lot of capital gains. You can use these hoarded losses against that huge capital gain in the future, which is pretty cool. So tax loss harvesting, something to really consider doing. Um, it's, it is an active um, you know, strategy, investment strategy. You'd want to probably work with a planner on this. Uh, SLP Wealth is an option, but uh, as tax loss harvesting is definitely something to, to look into. 
Now, the last thing on here, I put at the end because this would not really be applicable to you if you're an attending physician because your income is going to be too high to be able to take this deduction. But there is a student loan interest deduction using the IRS form 1098E. The interest deduction allows you to take um, 2,500 of paid interest and deduct that on your tax return each year if your income is below certain income thresholds. So this may only be relevant to residents and I would probably say single residents or residents whose income, if we're filing jointly, is lower than 165,000. So that's if we're married filing jointly, 165,000 or less, we can take that $2,500 deduction. If we're single, $80,000 or less of modified adjusted gross income, and we can take that uh, student loan interest deduction. There is a phase out where you can still take some of the deduction if we make above that. Uh, so between 80 and 95,000 for a single person, and then 165 to 195,000, there's a phase out where we can deduct some of it, not all of it. But if we're able to deduct the full 2,500, it's about a $500, $550 benefit to you usually. So that's something uh, may not be applicable to everybody, maybe only relevant in residency. If we file taxes married separately, like we were talking about before, we are not able to take this student loan interest deduction, but don't sweat it. It's not a huge amount of savings, uh, saves us about 500 bucks, maybe reduces our payment a tiny bit, but uh, not, not too crazy of savings. I mentioned public service loan forgiveness or PSLF for short, and this is a great program. I feel like it's a lot of times applicable to physicians who are working or staying in a public service capacity. This program will forgive your federal student loans after 10 years of employment. There's four things we have to check the box for. First is we have to work full time at an eligible employer for those 10 years. So government or 501c3, a lot of hospital systems are 501c3 entities. So check that out. There is a, uh, on studentaid.gov, there is a uh, little tracker that helps you put in the EIN number for your current employer to confirm if they're eligible. We have to have federal direct loans. So this is not applicable for uh, private student loans, just our federal direct loans. We have to be on an income driven repayment plan. So the cheapest income driven repayment plan is ideal. And we have to make 120 qualifying payments. So 120 months would be 10 years. Can't get the forgiveness sooner than 10 years. And if we meet those, those uh, little bullet points, then whatever balance is left on our loans is then forgiven. So it is a really great program if you plan on staying in a public service capacity and the forgiveness that happens uh, is tax free. So we don't have to worry about taxes on it, which is awesome. Let's talk about an example, a normal example for a physician. Let's say we've got about a $303,000 uh, balance. Actually, let's just bump this to 330. Seems to be about average. Then interest rate about 7%. We started repayment and or we're going to start repayment in 2024. And let's say this physician plans on staying in public service. There may be primary care, family physician, working in a hospital system paid by the nonprofit. Uh, let's say we're single, so pretty easy. Last year we didn't earn any, any income, but we filed a tax return. And if we do that, if we filed a tax return from last year, um, or if we uh, con consolidate our loans and apply for an income-driven plan uh, right after graduation, before we have a job, we can legitimately have a payment locked in on an income-driven plan for $0 a month, which is pretty cool. That still counts towards uh, public service loan forgiveness. And this year, we're only going to make half of our residency salary. So let's say the residency salary is about 70000 That means we'll make about 35000 this year. And next year, we'll have the full, salary, full residency salary. And then we'll have that growing you know, over the next couple of years. But then we'll also have our attending income kick in maybe four years down the road. So let's say we're going to be making about two fifty. dollars Let's say that's, uh, that's kind of the average income for primary care. So 250 is going to be our income. We make half of our residency salary that year. Uh, let me maybe bump this up a little bit. And half of our attending salary that year. So maybe 2028, we're looking at 165 for our income. And then our full attending income kicks in in 2029. 
So this is just a, an idea of income trajectory, what you can maybe expect as a physician doing four years of residency. Now, flipping over to payments, there are a lot of numbers on here, but we're really just gonna focus on these categories or columns. If we're pursuing PSLF, we know that we have to be on an income-driven plan. So we'd wanna be on the cheapest one. Right now, that's the save plan. It's being debated right now. Who knows what's gonna happen, but save plan is there. We could also consider new IBR if we didn't borrow before 2014. If uh, save goes away, we definitely still have access to old IBR and, or sorry, IBR in general, old IBR, and repay might come back. So if they do away with save, repay might come back. So these are some, just some examples of scenarios of what the payments could be, but pretty low, right? The first couple of years would be almost nothing towards our student loan payment. And this is why going into forbearance, residency forbearance, I advise against heavily because administ or sorry, uh, residency forbearance does not count towards PSLF going forward into the future. It also allows interest to accrue on the debt, which may not matter if you're doing PSLF, but it just, the main thing is it doesn't count towards forgiveness. So if we can have an income driven payment where the payment's pretty manageable, even on like 70,000 of income, then that, that's what we should do. We should be getting on an income driven plan to uh, collect that credit, collect some of those interest subsidies if, if maybe we end up not doing PSLF later and making progress on our loan one way or another. The main page here will give us an idea of what do each of these plans look like stacked up against each other? What if I did PSLF? What does it look like? Well, it's gonna pull through the cheapest income driven plan the monthly payments uh, add up to about 112. Remaining balance at the time of forgiveness would be about four. Actually, if we're on save, and if save continues to operate how it was written, no interest would accrue. So really the balance that would be forgiven on PSLF if we were still on the save plan would be what it is today, 330, because interest does not accrue even if um, it should mathematically because save is just, it was built that way. Uh, but that gets forgiven, no tax implication. We walk up, away paying 112000 towards the loans. So a fraction of what we borrowed, a third of what we borrowed, basically. So pretty gnarly there. Now, what if we did not do PSLF, though? That's where things turn into a conversation, right? Because if we're not doing PSLF, we're probably going to be in a slightly higher paying position going into private sector. So maybe after residency, instead of like 250 for our income, maybe it's closer to like 300 or 350. So I'll bump this up to maybe 150 for half the year. So residency and then half the year of attending. And then this year we'll bump this up to 300. 300. There we go. Oops. That would be nice, right? 3 million. 300,000. Uh, then that grows from there. And let's take a look at what that does to the payments. So payments kind of early on stay the same because our residency income is the same. But when we get into our attending position, that's when the payments get a little higher because we're being paid more. We're working in a higher paying position, being private sector. Without PSLF, things turn a little bit, right? We don't have forgiveness uh, as an option in the PSLF system because we're not working at an eligible employer if we're in private sector. So then we can consider like, do we stay on the save plan to the 25 years of forgiveness or the new IBR plan with 20 years of forgiveness? Interestingly, if we did do the new IBR plan, it's a 20 year forgiveness timeline without PSLF for anybody. Uh, based on that income, we'd pay about 500,000 towards the loans. We'd get about 290 forgiven. So still a pretty hefty balance forgiven. So this really tells me that even though we're making 300,000, those income driven plans, we, the payments based on that would just kind of make us spin our wheels. So we, we get a large balance forgiven still. We have to pay taxes on that forgiven balance if it's the longer term forgiveness. And the total cost is about 615. So this may not be ideal, right? We wanna maybe then consider paying the loans off more aggressively. And, you know, sometimes it can make sense to do the longer term forgiveness, though, like if our income wasn't going to be that high, like maybe let's say and it was going to be closer to 200. So let's drop this down. So instead of 300, it's going to be about 200, but we're still in private sector. Maybe we're in a really populated area. 
uh, payments are going to be lower over time, then forgiveness starts to look a little better. It's not not a like hands down, it's the best approach. But I would also argue like looking at things bigger picture because this is what we go through to help folks navigate their repayment plan in a student loan planner consultation. And, and so the conversation is, okay, well, this is a total cost here. This is on paper, how much we're gonna pay. This is kind of the financial planning definition of what we're gonna pay. The net present value is, is here. And so with the net present value number, we can start to compare different timelines. Like this is a 20 year timeline. This is a 25 year timeline. This is a 10 year timeline, right? Money is gonna spend differently and feel differently in 25, 20 and, and 10 years from now. So we have to kind of discount it down to today's dollars. So interestingly, on paper, save would be about 549 uh, for the total cost compared to 100,000 less, just paying it off really aggressively on that standard 10 year plan. Um, but when we look at net present value, save is actually cheaper. And so this is where the conversation starts because we got to ask, okay, well, do we want to have our main goal be to pay the, the student loans off really aggressively, pay 3,800, you know, a month towards these loans, even in residency? I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. You're probably not going to be able to do it during residency. Um, so then the question is, all right, well, do we want still a pretty attractive, efficient plan that can get the job done too. Maybe it's a little more expensive because we're we're dragging the timeline out, but the monthly payments are a lot more affordable. They allow us to focus on other financial goals too. Like that can be worth something. So that's why there's not like a cookie cutter plan for anybody, unfortunately, but also fortunately, because we can really craft our game plan around your main goals. Um, the other thing too is new IBR up here is actually the cheap cheaper option of the two income driven plans here. Uh, so that that's something to notice as well. But these are the types of conversations that I think are helpful to have with somebody who can really just run through the numbers with you and run through the numbers with you quickly, right? So going through all the different scenarios, really talking through the pros and cons of the different routes, talking through what your career trajectory might look like, because things change. And so it might be good to have a plan A, plan B, maybe even a plan C, just to make sure that you guys are taken care of. With that... You've got resources, you have us. If you need a consultation, that is literally what we do. Uh, we're, our bread and butter is helping people navigate their student loan plan. It is such a big piece to your financial plan. It makes sense to get it right and to feel confident and comfortable with your game plan. And the student loan system changes a lot. So <laughs> you also wanna make sure that you're up to date on the most recent legislation, the most recent hacks or tips for saving money. So if we can help you, feel more comfortable and rest easier at night about your financial situation when it comes to your student loans or, or your financial planning, uh, check us out, studentloanplanner.com. You can schedule a consultation and stay tuned for more videos around student loan related, financial planning related uh, topics. And I will catch you on the next one.